Please kneel as you are able. Sisters and brothers in Christ, on this holy night, we gather to observe in reverence and awe the crucifixion of Jesus on the cross for our salvation. His journey is our journey. His passion is our passion. His promise of life is ours as his followers. Therefore, let us mark Christ's passion and death on this night as we continue our journey to his resurrection. Blessed be God forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, we pray you graciously to behold this your family for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and given into the hands of sinners and to suffer death upon the cross, who now lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of Isaiah. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up, and shall be very high. Just as there were many who were astonished at him, so marred was his appearance beyond human semblance, and his form beyond that of mortals. So he shall startle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For the, that which had not been told them they shall see, and that which they had not heard they shall contemplate. Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity. And as one from whom others hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him of no account. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases. Yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and his bruises we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living and stricken for the transgression of my people. They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich. Although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth, 
Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish he shall see light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God. Let us pray the psalm together in unison. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And are so far from my cry and from the words of my distress. Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not answer. By night as well, but I find no rest. Yet you are the Holy One, enthroned upon the praises of Israel. Our forefathers put their trust in you. They trusted, and you delivered them. They cried out to you and were delivered. They trusted in you and were not put to shame. But as for me, I am a worm and no man. Scorned by all and despised by the people. All who see me laugh me to scorn. They curl their lips and wag their heads. Trusted in the Lord, let him deliver him, let him rescue him, if he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me out of the womb, kept me safe upon my mother's breast. I have been entrusted to you ever since I was born. You were my God when I was still in my mother's womb. Be ye not far from me, for trouble is near. And there is none to help. A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. The Holy Spirit testifies, saying, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts, and I will write them on their minds. He also adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, my friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart in full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people.
Hear the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Jesus went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden where he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas brought the detachment of soldiers together with the police from the chief priests and the Pharisees. And they came with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked them, Whom are you looking for? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus replied, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, Whom are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fill the word that he had spoken. I did not lose a single one of those whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword back into its sheath. Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? So the soldiers, their officer, and the Jewish police arrested Jesus and bound him. First they took him to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that, that year, Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it was better to have one person die for the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter was standing outside the gate. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out spoke to the woman who guarded the gate and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, You are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? Peter said, I am not. Now the slaves and the police made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing around and warming themselves. Peter also was standing with them and warming himself. When the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about the teaching, Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the police standing nearby struck Jesus on the face, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Annas set him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They asked him, You are not also one of his disciples, are you? Peter denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Again, Peter denied it, and at that moment the cock crowed. Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, 
What accusations do you bring against this man? They answered, Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews replied, This was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he, when he indicated to the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate answered the head, entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So you are a king. Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, What is truth? After he had said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no case against him, but you have a custom that I release someone for you at Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? They shouted in reply, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a bandit. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And striking him on the face, Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Here is the man. When the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, Crucify! Crucify! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. The Jews answered him, Now, when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you and power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at the place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the time of day of the preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. Pilate said to the Jews, Here is your king. They cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate asked them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, <clears throat> Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross himself, he went out to the place that was called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, 
with two others and one on either side with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written, put on the cross, and it read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And, when, and, and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, <coughs> Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but a gas box. This was to fill what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves, for my clothing they cast lots. And that was what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into, her own, into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that it was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and said, held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because that Sabbath was a great, uh, the day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead. They did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified so that you may believe. His testimony is true, and he knows what he tells is the truth. These things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of scripture says, they will look upon the one whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one, because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and removed the body. Nicodemus, who had at first come to Jesus by night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices in the linen cloths, according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified. And in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so, because it was the Jewish day of preparation and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there.
be seated. If you have been to the Cathedral of Notre Dame in Paris, you have likely seen one of the great sculptures of Europe, which is the sculpture of the Pietà, which is at the head of the high altar. If you've seen pictures of the interior of the cathedral since the fire, you've seen that statue with that great golden cross above it, apparently both untouched. The face of Mary is a face of great sorrow, and her hands are extended in, in this kind of prayerful position, in kind of a kind of resignation that what was predicted had come to pass. Early on in Jesus' life, it was said that a sword would pierce her heart, and indeed, it did. And her sadness is our sadness. Her pain is our pain. Imagine what that felt like some 2,000 years ago this very day. The disciples, Mary, John, all of the followers, thought that Jesus indeed was dead. Though he had promised the resurrection on that grim Friday night, was there resurrection? So many times in the course of our lives when we are in the midst of incredible darkness, can we see the light of resurrection? It is that for which we hope. It is that for which we pray. It is why gathered here tonight on this solemn Good Friday, we don't stop here, but we look to the tomb and beyond the tomb and the darkness of the tomb to the glorious light of resurrection. Our faith, as I said last night at the Monday Thursday service, would make no sense whatsoever without that resurrection. But let us tonight unite with Mary, our sister, the mother of Jesus, and all of those who stood near or far even at that night at that cross to be one with them in their sorrow, but also to consider being one with them on the day that we call the resurrection. We invite you tomorrow to be with us for the, the great vigil of, of Easter, the most powerful service of the year, also one of the most complicated. We will have a baptism as well, and then two glorious uh, services on, on Easter day. God continues to be with us, to guide us, and to lead us. We have journeyed from Palm Sunday to the course of this week, to Monday, Thursday, powerful foot washing, <coughs> altar of repose, Many of us stayed last night to pray. Stations of the Cross at noon. Church was open for three more hours of prayer. And here we are tonight. And we thank God for these many, many opportunities we've had throughout the course of Lent to ensure that we indeed treasure the relationship that we have with God and we can be assured that God treasures that relationship with us as well. May it continue.
Dear people of God, our Heavenly Father sent his Son into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved, that all who believe in him might be delivered from the power of sin and death and become heirs with him of everlasting life. We pray, therefore, for people everywhere according to their needs. Let us pray for the Holy Catholic Church of Christ throughout the world. For its unity in witness and service. For all bishops and other ministers and the people whom they serve. For Michael and Wayne, our bishops, and all the people of this diocese. For all Christians in this community, that God will confirm the church in faith, increase it in love, and preserve it in peace. Almighty and everlasting God, by whose spirit the whole body of your faithful people is governed and sanctified, receive our supplications and prayers which we offer before you for all members of your holy church, that in their vocation and ministry they may truly and devoutly serve you through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for all nations and peoples of the earth and for those in authority among them. For the President of the United States, for the Congress and the Supreme Court, for the representatives of the United Nations, for all who serve the common good, that by God's help they may seek justice and truth and live in peace and concord. Almighty God, kindle, we pray, in every heart the true love of peace and guide with your wisdom those who take counsel for the nations of the earth, that in tranquility your dominion may increase until the earth is filled with the knowledge of your love through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for all who suffer and are afflicted in mind or in body. For the hungry and the homeless, the destitute and the oppressed, for the sick, the wounded and the crippled, for those in loneliness, fear and anguish, for those who face temptation, doubt, and despair, for the sorrowful and bereaved, for prisoners and captives, and those in mortal danger, that God in his mercy will comfort and relieve them, and grant them the knowledge of his love, and stir up in us the will and patience to minister to their needs. Gracious God, the comfort of all who sorrow, the strength of all who suffer. Let the cry of those in misery and need come to you, that they may find your mercy present with them in all their afflictions. And give us, we pray, the strength to serve them for the sake of him who suffered for us, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for all who have not received the gospel of Christ. For those who have never heard the word of salvation, for those who have lost their faith, for those hardened by sin or indifference, for the contemptuous and the scornful, for those who are enemies of the cross of Christ and persecutors of his disciples, for those who in the name of Christ have persecuted others, that God will open their hearts to the truth and lead them to faith and obedience. Merciful God, creator of all the peoples of the earth and lover of souls, have compassion on all who do not know you as you are revealed in your Son, Jesus Christ. Let your gospel be preached with grace and power to those who have not heard it. Turn the hearts of those who resist it and bring home to your fold those who have gone astray, that there may be one flock under one shepherd Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. 
Let us commit ourselves to our God and pray for the grace of a holy life, that with all who have departed this world and have died in the peace of Christ, that those whose faith is known to God alone, we may be accounted worthy to enter into the fullness of the joy of our Lord and receive the crown of life in the day of resurrection. O oh God of unchangeable power and eternal light, look favorably on your whole church, that wonderful and sacred mystery. By the effectual working of your providence, carry out in tranquility the plan of salvation. Let the whole world see and know that things which are cast down are being raised up, and things which had grown old are being made new and that all things are being brought to their perfection by him through whom all things were made, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated as you are able. Please stand as you are able. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you. Because by your holy cross, you have redeemed the world. If we have died with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, we shall reign with him. We glory in your cross, O Lord, and, and praise, praise and glorify your holy resurrection. For by virtue of your cross, joy has come to the whole world. 
Please be seated as you are able. Throughout the Episcopal Church, tonight's collection actually goes to the church in Jerusalem. The cathedral, uh, St. Mark's, uh, St. George's, sorry, in, in, um, in Jerusalem, actually has charge of five countries in the Middle East. So our commitment to that ministry continues. I ask you to be as generous as you are able. When we uh, celebrate communion today, we celebrate communion only from the reserved sacrament. We are not permitted to celebrate the Eucharist on Good Friday. The sacrament was there last night and now is actually in the working sacristy. It is not to be in the body of the church on the day of Good Friday. So we will celebrate Eucharist, but we will actually um, distribute communion down here in front of the cross. Thank you. Please stand as you are able. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us all our sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen us in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, 
keep us in eternal life. Amen. Amen. Now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Blood of Christ, the cup of salvation.
Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, we pray you to set your passion, cross, and death between your judgment and our souls, now and in the hour of our death. Give mercy and grace to the living, pardon and rest to the dead. To your holy church, give peace and concord, and to us sinners, give us everlasting life and glory. For with the Father and the Spirit, you live and reign, one God, now and forever. Amen. As we go forth in silence, our tradition, if you wish, is to come and venerate the cross in whatever way you like, simply to pause, to perhaps touch the wood of the cross. Some like to even kiss the wood of the cross. Please feel free to do whatever makes you comfortable. Thank you for being here, and may you have a holy and blessed Easter. <laughs>